Our next speaker, just before we break here for lunch, and we're probably just going to have about, about another five minute break for lunch after this one. So uh, this guy is an activist and speaker from London who's been uh, the street activism coordinator for several years. Uh, in addition to contributing to TZM town hall sessions and Q&A pan panels. Here to give a talk entitled Beneficial Technology Beyond Skynet Thinking. Please give a thunderous applause to Adam Gilliland. Um, good afternoon all. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your talk so far. Um, this is going to be a relatively simple um, presentation. Um, the reason I came up with the title that I did is because there is still a lot of fear and apprehension about technology. What I've actually found is that there is even a lot of fear and apprehension about technology, even in people who actually recognize the potential benefit of it, if used wisely. Um, so I thought it was just a really good idea to just run over some of the technologies that we have available. I could have spent a very long time doing this one. Um, I kept it very simple, and actually you'll probably see from some of the presentation that it was done a bit more, in a bit more of a rush way than I wanted to, there you go. Um, so essentially I'm just gonna cover four areas of technology, uh, which are, I can't even remember what they are, so there we go. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, they are energy, transportation, food production, and construction. Now, the reason for having chosen those was because they are central to you know, uh, our well-being as, as individuals and as a society. So everything that we can do to actually use technology wisely to enact our well-being and societal well-being is actually really important. I could have done communication and taken an extra 10 years to do that one, nanotechnology another five years, et cetera, et cetera. So I really didn't want to go down that avenue, so I've just kept it very basic for today. So um, again, please forgive me if some of the slides look a bit haphazard, but you'll get the drift as we go along. Um, what I will do is actually, what's not on the slide is some of the stuff that I wanted to pick up from from some of our other speakers today. So thank you very much for you all for giving me some inspiration um, to add to what I'm going to do today. Um, so anyway, the reason, as I said, for the subtitle of today is because of this sort of stuff. Um, this is the sort of pervasive view that the general population are given about technology is that it's somehow freaky, it's somehow nothing to do with us, um, it's going to control us, and it becomes very fearful, um, and these are very classic images from that fear-driven, that way of creating fear with technology. And these are the reasons why, or well, some of them anyway, um, why we have this conditioning around technology. Um, as you can see, it's based on the current socio-economic system, the monetary market system. Um, it's used for profit and the interests of a small number of people at the moment. Automation is basically being used to cut workforces, cut costs, regardless of the consequences, for example, as we've had from the Extinction Rebellion um, presentation to the planet, and therefore all of us. It's, it's a, one of the things that I got from the first presentation today was the fact that um, the narrative that we can really live out of um, that's partly imposed by us, but partly is self-imposed from our shadow, um, from actually enacting our shadow, the shadow side of ourselves, is that it's a separative, fearful, mistrusting um, way of behaving, and that not uncommonly gives a rise to a sense of mistrusting technology, because it's seen as separate to us, 
it's seen as something that we should be wary of rather than actually something that we can embrace and actually work with. So there's that, there's that element as well. And a quote from the lovely late Jack Fresco, um, as you can see, if all the old current values aren't altered, you're going to have the same condition multiplied by technology. Technology is used the wrong way today, it's used in a detrimental way, and as long as you continue that, we're going to harm society. And again, harking back to the Extinction Rebellion presentation, we're actually going to do damage to the planet using technology for profit and for personal, personal gain. So from that point, I'm just literally going to go into the different forms of technology um, and give some examples of what I consider to be benefit, beneficial technology. Technologies can be used wisely, that can be used to enhance society, that can be actually used to enhance us all as individuals as well as our societal well-being. Um, so here we go. So starting with energy, solar. Um, I mean, we've all heard a lot more about these technologies. Solar and particularly solar um, photovoltaic recently. Um, it's always been a very difficult subject for some people to talk about because the efficiency rates in particular of solar voltaic, photovoltaic has actually been very low. As we can see, they're increasing rapidly in, within the advancing technology. Um, for example, a year ago, even that standard efficiency was probably around about 12 to 13 percent. We're now up to 22.2 as a standard with a maximum potential of 46. So very high conversion rates with changes in the, the current technology. Um, as you can see, thin film, other forms of solar technology becoming increasingly efficient using less resources. So we're using less silicon, less energy to produce the photovoltaic cells, etc., etc. And also, I think it's very interesting that even on a personal level, you have regardless of what people may think of Musk and Tesla and the whole the whole company and its thinking, the fact that he and others are now making this more efficient form of soap and technology available to people to put wherever they want to put it or whatever building they want to put it is actually quite useful to know and it's quite good news in the long term. Um, Solar towers. Um, the first time I ever saw a solar tower together with all the uh, mirrors, I was absolutely horrified. I thought, oh my god, this looks like science fiction, if anything does. Um, just thinking all these, all these rays of sunlight bouncing around where they weren't supposed to be. Um, but in fact, obviously, they've reflected back onto a tower um, in order to create electricity, essentially, eventually. Um, as you can see, some actually have quite a high yield per installation. That 392 megawatts is probably above the average, but my understanding of the average at the moment is that for most solar towers, we're still talking around about 300, between 275 and 300 uh, megawatt gross capacity. Um, highly renewable resources, as you can see, silicon, sodium potassium nitrates to generate energy, um, obviously sunlight reflected back onto the tower as long as we are using relevant materials to increase the reflective capacity of the mirrors around the tower then you obviously get you obviously get more energy for your bark and for each mirror which is probably far more important I don't want to talk too much about money today um, because we're moving past it whether we like it or not um, and however we deal with that. Um, and greenhouse gases, as it says, limited largely to the actual construction. Um, but like all things with mass output, mass technology, the amount of resources that you use actually decreases per installation in this case. Um, solar facades. Um, I've always been very, very keen, and I think it's actually really important that we start thinking more seriously about diffuse energy production, turning every single building and every single installation, every single thing that we create, 
actually has to have an energy generating component. And I actually like the idea that we can use windows, door frames, you name it, even putting sort of wind turbines on top of things, around things, um, just whatever we can do to actually create as much energy with as minimal resource use as possible and as obviously as few emissions as possible, which is core to what's going on here. Um, so as you can see, we actually use building surfaces to create energy from sunlight. Um, there are different types of glass now being created whereby you can change the refractive index of the glass. You can actually have different forms of dimming on glass. Um, it's coming along quite quickly now, uh, especially in the last five years. Um, and if you put that together with storage, you know, really high quality storage, renewable storage capacity, then essentially every single building, every window, every door, every roadway, actually create, we can have energy from and store energy from all of them. And again, that harks back to something about the narrative from the first presentation we had today, which was energy generation these days comes from this very separative big brother top-down approach that society has at the moment, which is a few people know best, we know best, we generate the energy and we give it to you. That's, so we're heading away from that. So just be warned. If you're not, um, if not comfortable with the idea of like having responsibility for your own energy generation storage, you best get on board really quick. Um, floating solar parks um, weren't really particularly popular and widespread until about three or four years ago. Um, China is leading the way in actually creating these. Um, as it says, gener generation capacity, not huge, 40 megawatts, given the amount of it's a service area they need to be able to generate that. That's quite a lot, so bear that in mind. But they can be located on existing or newly created areas of water. Um, there, are, there are ways of actually reducing evaporation, which can be helpful in combating climate change and global warming to some extent. Um, because the more water vapour there is in the atmosphere, the the more temperature will rise. Um, and there is a lot of evaporation from the oceans as the climate warms. Um, that's, a, that's a fairly basic function. Um, and the cooler, as you say, cooler ambient air temperature limits exposure. Essentially what it means is that it, it creates its own cooling system around the farm, around the plant, and therefore the actual panels themselves don't get as hot and heat is a major degrading factor in solar voltaic and similar technologies. So anything that keeps them cool is really useful. Um, solar roadways, one of my favorites for many years. I first found out about these in 2010, if memory serves me right. Um, been a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Um, the solar roadways company, um, Scott Brussel and his wife and his colleagues have basically now have some of these installed in small areas around the states in particular. Um, I personally think it hasn't worked, come fast enough. The fact that you can generate energy just from roadways and pathways is amazing. Um, as you can see, just from that one figure alone, Estimated generation, if you laid the entire road surface of the US land mass, or, um, the US land mass you'd get the equivalent of 14,085 billion kilowatt hours alone just from having these on every road and paving service, which I think is phenomenal. Um, and again, that's only based on that efficiency level, um, but it can do better. Um, it can replace all current road surfaces because it has been tested for heavy load bearing. 
Um, so it can bear large trucks because it's tempered glass, um, it's a particular form of tempered glass. And as it says, you can incorporate other important factors such as lighting, heating, storage, um, and of course it's self-powering. And the useful thing about solar roadways is that it's from daylight rather than direct sunlight. And you know we have daylight more than we have absolute sunlight, so it means it will continue it continues generating even at a lower level quite a lot of the day, even at northern latitudes. Um, and hence that figure there based on the US land mass and the Canadian border latitude testing. Wind. Um, it's always been, I've always been cautious about wind power. Um, I have a sense that perhaps it hasn't had as many impact, uh, environmental impact assessments um, done on it to actually determine its safety on other, you know, on other creatures, but apparently that's not the case anymore. Um, environmental impact assessments are done on all wind farms now. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, large, large turbine, 9.5 megawatts. Um, so obviously in what they call farms, be it onshore, offshore, that's a considerable generation capacity and particularly in those latitudes, those parts of the world where wind is a, consist a fairly consistent factor, um, consistent climatic factor. Um, as we say, it can be used onshore um, or offshore. The decibel levels can actually depend to some extent on the environment in which they're placed. Um, the whole thing about noise levels with large blade turbines, yes, of course, they generate noise, but they, to a large extent, they actually generate less noise than having a truck running past your home on a road. So that's some comparison. Um, and, you know, if they are offshore, then they have quite a low um, noise and vibration generation, which obviously is better for wild, um, aquatic wildlife. Um, and impact on the wildlife can be minimised, although again, you know, the whole concept of large turbines with birds not necessarily being able to present themselves and flying into them, that's happened, it still happens, but less so. Um, I gather that for example, some wind turbines now have a sound system attached and deliberately to actually warn wildlife that may be flying towards them, which is interesting. Um, small wind turbines, they're really, it's really obvious what their benefits are because in terms of diffuse energy generation, which I mentioned just now, they could be put on all sorts of buildings, all sorts of existing structures um, to generate energy. Um, as it says, um, 3.5 terawatt potential capacity in the UK alone, just from installing them widely. Um, different types of design and scale, to, uh, depending on your locality and your environment. Um, can be used individually or in sort of almost like mini farms. Uh, there are some examples, some experiments being done with small wind turbines being placed around the building to actually complement energy generate other forms of energy generation in a single building to create, create what they call uh, a mixed um, a mixed energy generation um, local mixed energy generation capacity um, which I spoke about earlier on diffuse generation um, very low if any decibel levels they're very quiet um, and the impact of these types of wind turbines are considerably less for obvious reasons. Um, geothermal, I mean, I really only started thinking about geothermal when I joined Zeitgeist Movement back in 2009. Um, and at that time, what we were told was that it could only be used in certain places. What's now become obvious is that being able to drill through to the Earth's crust attack into geothermal energy is actually broader than we think. You do not have to be near um, a seismic a seismic active area. You do not have to be near volcanoes. You do not have to be near um, glaciers. Um, there are 
you can do it in a lot more, in much more diffuse areas than just those now. Um, I think it was estimated that geothermal alone, if tapped suitably, can probably generate energy for this entire current civilization with its current energy use for the next five to six thousand years alone if we use it efficiently. So that gives you some idea of the scale, if it's it scaled out. Um, and as we can see, three types of generation or currently recognized types, which are dry steam, flash steam, and binary cycle power stations. I won't get into the technology today. Um, you can do some research online about that. Um, and it can be used for direct or indirect use. Um, people swimming in lovely heated pools close to um, geothermal power stations in Iceland. It's one of those big things that many people here have probably seen. Um, but that's far from their only, their only way of using it. Um, and it has a small footprint, negligible emissions, and those emissions are essentially steam with some other particulate matter, but very, very, very negligible amounts. Um, wave power, um, essentially the ability to tap into the kinetic energy of water around the planet. Um, it's everywhere, we should be using it, we're not. It's, it's a no-brainer, to be honest. Um, as you can see from the figures, I mean, estimated total US wave energy capacity, 23 gigawatts. Um, the current operation in ILA is actually working very well. Um, and as you can see, it has the whole thing about kinetic energy, got a thousand times kinetic energy of wind, and very, um, very minimal loss of potential from wave motion. Um, whereas wind tends to be much more, the, um, the extremes of wind are much greater. 24-7 um, generation, um, more consistent, um, use up less land area. That figure is um, one that I actually got from, or the, what, there's a wave power institution. Um, and plants can be located in all sorts of places. And um, these are just, these, these stills are just different versions you know, of, a, of a similar technology, just actually generating power in a slightly different way, but all from the motion of tides and water. Um, tidal power, this I picked this one in particular because it's one of the most famous tidal power stations in Northern France. Um, Operating, um, as you can see, for some time now, it's been updated regularly. Um, average output is now 57 megawatts, which is well, obviously the peak of 240. Lots of sites around the, the world can potentially be used. Um, as you can see, one of the concerns, and I think it's justifiable one, is about the impact on the environment around where the structures are built because of the change in flow of water, the change in density of water and temperature of water. My understanding is that they've actually dealt with that situation quite well with the Hans power station, but there are still concerns about this particular type of energy generation for that reason. Um, as it says, there are also power transmission issues. So if you actually, apparently it's very difficult to run power from tidal barrage to wherever you want it to go for some reason. I, I need to do a bit more research on that, but apparently power transmission there is an issue, less uh, more so than with other forms of energy. Um, storage, one of the things that people used to talk about a lot around renewable energy generation was storage. And it was one of the things that actually made local generation, diffuse generation, really potentially difficult to consider. Um, but with innovations like these, it actually makes it more possible that local communities, be it cities, towns, villages, whatever size it may be, can actually generate multiple forms of energy and store them and use them with and for each other within that community and possibly even feed into a grid, as we do now, to to give energy, quote unquote, to other parts that may not actually be generating as much or storing as much for various reasons. Um, Powerball, 
fairly recent, um, really good at actually sort of cutting in when there are outages, apparently. Um, as it says, individual storage capacity, 13.5 kilowatts, um, as long as you don't have anything really high use, but apparently they're developing power walls that will now even put up with like high, high usage um, equipment. Um, it's scalable. The reason for me putting what they call the power pack at the bottom there in Australia is that, as you can see, it's like, you can do up to 10 power walls, but industrially, you can have these almost like massive power wall batteries that store a huge amount of energy and can actually act when other forms of energy is cut out. So they can definitely, apparently they can actually sort enough on one occasion to run um, electricity supplies for that part of Australia for the 36 hours following an outage of the general grid. Um, so very effective. Um, but also off-grid capacity, um, it means that you can, it obviously stores and continues to provide energy if there are outages, or you can actually use them individually so that we actually get closer to this diffuse energy generation that I've been talking about a lot. Um, it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, this, I was talking to Adam a little while ago before we started, um, and other people. This, um, I saw this back in 2008, actually, before I became a uh, member of the Zeitgeist Movement. And essentially, this Bloom Energy Service, it's called, is remarkably effective, but it seems to have been left behind for some reason. I don't really know why. Um, but it's actually quite a simple form of technology. Essentially, you have these solid oxide fuel cells, which you can then lay out into stacks yeah, and then you can actually form the stacks into modules and then create, as it says you see here, like actual energy servers, which are incredibly efficient at storing energy um, and releasing energy when needed. Um, as you can see, it's a very simple technology. It converts, converts fuel into electricity through an electrical process, no combustion involved, and very efficient, apparently. Um, the efficiency ratio is approximately 65%. So from the fuel, from this, the solid resource to fuel generation, that's actually quite high generation. Um, as it says, each, each server produces 600 kilowatts power um, from the size of like half a ship, a 30 foot shipping container. And as I said before, stores and distributes energy and is scalable. So you can have as many of those end ones, those end servers, as you like together um, to form a power pack, similar to the Tesla sort of power pack, industrial size, if need be. On to transportation, very smoothly, a bit smoother than I expected, but there we go. Um, and again, the focus here, and you'll see it actually in some of the, the writing by the slides, is on fuel efficiency as much as it is on you know, speed and distance coverage, etc. So you'll see a lot of that in the writing here. Mag, magnetic levitation, levitation maglev trains have been around for a, a long time, um, gradually improving um, in speed. Um, very, actually, quite, again, quite a simple technology. Two sets of magnets, one to elevate, one to create form of momentum. Um, as you can see, speed record just over an open track in open air is um, 603 kilometers an hour. Um, people used to be concerned about the acceleration deceleration ratios, but in fact, they actually do both very efficiently. Magnets are very good at precise acceleration and deceleration um, and very smooth in both as well. Um, especially at high speeds and long distances, um, very very energy efficient and given the speeds that they travel at, that would make that would be the, probably the, the wisest use of, of the technology to be honest. Um, let me go on to, oh, let me go back to, um, this Evacuated tube transfer is essentially it's maglev in a vacuum or low pressure tube. It's been talked about again for a very, very long time. Um, it's taken a very long time to get where we are. 
The main reason, of course, for which is the current system and money, um, because you need money to do anything, uh, especially major projects. Um, and again, runs on a very, um, essentially quite a simple technology. It's been around for a long time. The, what they've, they've given it trademarks, surprise, surprise, another part of the system, patenting. Um, it's called indirect track technology. So linear motor, use electromagnetism to propel these capsules very fast through um, tubes. Um, they, the experiments seem to be towards low pressure rather than completely evacuated tubes. Um, I think it's just to actually maintain the vacuum is more difficult than maintaining low pressure. But even so, if you remove most of the air from these tubes, you still actually create much less drag, uh, much less inertia. So it still, it still has its uses. Um, pods stop at stops along the way. There are actually little stops or stations along the way where you can get on, get off. Uh, again, deceleration, acceleration, very, very, very highly controlled, very precise, as with maglev, without the tube technology. Um, and as you can see, the Chinese trial of a vacuum maglev train ran at that speed, like 7 to 1200 kilometers an hour. That speed of 6,000 kilometers an hour, I was seeing back in 2009 and 10. Um, but again, because the way the system operates, it's not moving particularly fast. Uh, we're getting there, and actually with Musk and Tesla coming on board, and Hyperloop, which is the other major company who are now sort of progressing this technology, it will probably actually happen fairly quickly. They already have test sites in China, Dubai, and um, I think one other place as well. So they're actually starting to implement this technology. Um, essentially, top one is a general overview of what the tube and you know, a pod a pod would look like. That's the Hyperloop's version of the test pod. Down there is the type of station um, that they've invented for these systems. Things can come in easily and go out in quite easily as well, with very, very little reason to stop these pods for any length of time. They're meant to be individualized. They can actually carry cargo as well, quite considerable amounts of cargo at the same speed. Um, so they can be used for cargo and people carriage. Um, hydrogen fuel cells, again, technology that's been around for a while, but it's actually been, um, it's been brought to its highest capacity at the moment and its highest level. Um, very high energy efficiency not really good at high speed travel. Um, again, though, core to all of these transportation technologies, very low emissions and very low energy use um, per kilowatt, um, or per, per kilowatt hour. So, I mean, you get virtually no emissions from a hydrogen fuel cell tray. Um, doesn't need as you can see, it doesn't need widespread electrification, which actually can be a hazard to wildlife and actually to people as well. You know, overhead electrification, those that type of thing. Um, and battery mode, you know, as it says here, literally as the train comes to a halt, it generates electricity. So it actually recharge, the batteries recharge themselves, which I think is actually quite cool. Um, again, top speed's not great, so probably better for urban or short to medium distance travel. Um, I would imagine, anyway. Um, monorails. Um, monorails have actually been around a long time. There's one in Germany that's been around since the 1920s in Fortal. Um So, yeah. But it hasn't come along very far. Again, high energy efficiency, low, low to zero cognition, depending on the type of monorail we're talking about. Um, Oh, there are those three main variations, but there are slight variations even on those main things. So the straddle beam, maglev, and suspension um, can operate at higher speeds because, especially the maglev versions, can operate at quite high speeds. Um, but again, because of the type of infrastructure that they use, probably better at medium distance. Can be used long distance, probably medium distance or urban travel as you can see from some of those slides there. Um, and 
one of the beauties to me of monorail and any technology for transportation to go overground is that we are overground, not underground. I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I actually find underground travel really oppressive and very unpleasant, um, even if I'm one of a few people traveling at any given time. I don't know why, that, that's just me. Um, um, I came across SkyTran in 2011, thought it was just an incredibly simple, clever system. Essentially, as you can see, you have a set of rails going over ground, and individual pods come to a stop, come to these very, very simple stops. So that it's close to being individualized, you can call on them whenever you want to, they pick you up and they take you off to wherever you want to go to. Um, Again, low cost, but particularly, more importantly, low resource construction, um, essentially zero carbon emissions. Um, I, I think they are just about to start a main service in Nigeria, I think in Lagos, and they've actually done trials in a, of a service in um, Israel. Really good quality service, works very well. No reported problems at all, no stoppages, no outages, nothing. Um, so clearly a technology for the future. Um, again, you can see from the speeds, probably better in urban environments, but you know, 200, 200 miles an hour, it's fairly decent. That should get you between one city and another very quickly, especially compared to current technologies. That's actually pretty good. Um, the humble bus, um, Still one of my favourites, uh, for various reasons. Um, electric buses um, are growing in size and, ability and uh, mileage ability rapidly, as you can see from the bottom part there. Um, now the longest distance one charge is 350 miles. There is a company called Proterra, who I've actually used for this slide, who are leaders in this large vehicle battery technology. Um, so they've been doing a lot of work in the last six years. Um, and again, they've got this whole idea of regenerative braking, which means that as the vehicle slows down, it generates electricity as it comes to a halt. It's only when it comes to a halt that that stops. So again, you're even generating, it's generating its own technology when it stops. Again, it's pretty cool. Um, sea transportation, not moving quite as fast as others, but there are fairly obvious reasons for that, in a way. Um, this is an experimental craft, um, as you can probably tell. Um, and again, as it says, main power source is hydrogen fuel cell, but Others, as you can see, are built in with some solar panels and some wind turbines there um, to try and capture. And obviously, if you're going across, especially large tracts of water, you could understand how useful the introduction, the addition of those extra energy sources would be. Um, again, zero carbon emissions, uh, especially from hydrogen fuel cell. Um, as it says, hydrogen production is problematic because of the large scale electrolysis involved, but they can actually store massive amounts of energy before they even set off. Um, and together with the other sustainable technologies included, travel large distances um, at quite reasonable speeds. Um, and again, scalable, that's actually quite a big mine, so that's, a, that's about 50 feet in width. I suppose I should be using metric more, but sorry about that. Um, I'm still half a dinosaur. Um, so that's that one. And at the moment, there are ferries operating in Scandinavia on short distance journeys where they are beginning to develop um, this type of sort of electric ferry, purely electric ferry technology. Um, I've seen some really interesting um, images and some footage. And what's very interesting is when they come into dock, you will have two almost build, small buildings on each side of the, the lock as the ship comes in. As soon as it docks, they are plugged in and essentially it starts to be charging straight away. And within an hour, it will have enough energy to actually do its next journey. 
Um, and apparently they're improving that um, that turnaround quite quickly. Um, again, zero carbon emissions, um, low mileage at present, um, but as battery storage technology increases and improves, those distances will become greater, for example, as with bus technology. Um, and again, you can use multiple technologies on one ship, um, as you saw in the other the previous slide. <laughs> Going on to um, food production. Again, I'm whizzing through this because I know I've only got a brief amount of time. So food production, many forms of indoor production, even in operation as we speak. Um, other technologies being developed or improvements on these technologies. So these are just the latest ones. Um, again, what I'm trying to get across is these are all existing technologies. We're not doing anything new here. These, we could put these in place en masse already. Um, so um, in aquaponics, um, again, these are all soilless growing, um, growing facilities. Um, in aquaponic facilities, the micro temperature and humidity are controlled, zero carbon emissions, and they all use renewable technology to generate whatever, whatever energy they need to within the facility. As it says, plants grown symbiotically in nutrient water, fertilized by a fish excrement. Could be other things as well. Uh, and when plants actually die, that goes back into the water to feed the fish. Um, so it's a closed loop system which is another important factor. Um, and both types of so-called food, um, if, you, you know, if you're a flesh eater, it's a omnivore, then fish will be food for you as well. Um, are both available for consumption. They're scalable. Um, in aquaponics, they tend to be scalable over land area on a single level, perhaps maximum double level because of the volume of water that, fish, that you need to actually breed the fish and keep the fish. Um, so less so upwards, more outwards. Um, and again, with all of these food production technologies, it's about local production and distribution. Of course, you can send you can send food further afield if they, if it's needed, but these will help to maintain food production in a given community or area, from literally from village up to city scale potentially. Um, Hydroponics, again, soil is growing, um, again, light temperature, uh, wind control, zero carbon emissions, um, again, used with your um, energy generation. Um, plants in this particular type of growing, plants are grown with the roots immersed in a nutrient rich medium, water, a film, there are also some other substances that are used that actually hold water um, for long periods of time, but those mediums can also be refreshed. Um, such as coir, coir is one example, um, and again, as with everything with these technologies, considerable use in resource use. So the use of water reduced by 80 to 90 percent in an average hydroponics facility, and that's tested because this is technology that's already on the go. Um, again, local production and distribution of foodstuffs. Um, aeroponics, same same principle, but in this on this occasion, micro droplets are sprayed into um, are sprayed onto the roots um, on a regular basis. Nutrient rich, um, similar technology to um, hydroponics, but actually, if anything, even more scalable, particularly upwards. The vertical farm idea, particularly with aeroponics, is a major movement forward. There is a company called Aero Farms that are actually doing this now. They are producing huge amounts of food for both local and national use, um, and of various plant types as well. And again, water use reduction is huge. Um, you know, in aeroponics, even more so than with hydroponics. Um, again, local production and distribution are the core of this entire presentation around food production. And again, I mean, just to give you some examples of what's being produced at the moment, with aquaponics, there's a company called Eatworks in New York that are producing 130,000 pounds of greens, 50,000 pounds of fish per annum. Um, that's quite considerable. Um, hydroponics, 
just as an example, Planet Earth, the facility called Planet Earth down in Kent, actually produced 12% of the tomato crop, 11% of the pepper crop, and 8% of the cucumber crop for the entire nation back in 2013. Um, and that's just from the one facility that they have. Um, aeroponics, um, again, aero farms can produce up to 2 million pounds of food per annum of you know, various, various crops. Doesn't have, it can be monoculture. Monoculture is not such a problem actually with these technologies, but it tends to be uh, multiple multiple crops. Um, and again, as we said before, aeroponic, hydroponic, vertical farming, obviously much greater use for less land area use, uh, much greater production for less land area use, um, going upwards rather than outwards. Um, construction, this is my final one for today. Um, <coughs> And again, the emphasis is on safe and renewable. Um, 3D printing construction, again, I came across back in the mid 2000s. So it's, again, it's been around a long time. Again, because of this system, it's taken a long time to develop, much longer than we would have expected. Um, but essentially, its benefits are its fast construction, as you can see from the figures here 650 foot square home, that's walls, partitions, roof as little as 24 hours to produce. Um, additive layer construction from a CAD design, so you feed your design into a computer, computer relays that to crane and other, um, re relays that to the machine arm, which then actually lays um, concrete or whatever other substance accordingly. Um, no human input is actually required. You can have somebody to supervise the machine, but they've actually produced buildings without the need for humans to be around. Humans come along afterwards and go into the various crevices, nooks and crannies, to actually install things like electrical wires and plumbing. But there is technology afoot which will install those two um, in the not too distant future, so watch this space. Um, and, oh, I don't know why I've left the air, it just goes to show you how quickly I did the slideshow. Um, and the other really important part of this, again, around the safe and renewable, is the amount of waste building in this way is reduced considerably. Apparently, from the latest figure I've seen, this size of house built this way actually uses 65% less concrete. Um, and apparently that can be reduced further. Um, so, again, watch this space. Um, shape memory materials. Um, as it says, they're materials that have an original shape, can be put out of that shape and will return to that shape given the correct triggers and stimuli. Um, those are just examples, metals, polymers, other plastics. As you can see, again, used already in construction, uh, bridges, roads, building reinforcement. Um, Pre-stressing of concrete, um, they actually use memory shape, memory alloys to stress the concrete um, before it's actually put in place so that it actually has great capacity to give um, when it's actually put in place. Um, again, there's earthquake, earthquake resistance is a big one in some parts of the world, clearly. Um, and um, again, already being used in space-related construction and aviation, even around engine engineering on aircraft. Um, I saw an amazing video yesterday, and the day before yesterday about that. Um, I did have this little clip of this object, <laughs> this particular set of like, um, this combination of metal alloys together. Um, I'm not gonna play it now, but I gather that this is being put out for, um, the video will be shared at some point in the future. So if you click on that link, you will actually see this moving from the shape that it's been pushed into to the shape it was, the shape it originally went and um, started from. It's amazing. Um, the other thing that's actually being used at the moment are sort of mini robots, if you want to like mini robot teams. Um, they, there is an increasing interest in those being shaped, or actually being built out of these shaped metal materials, these shaping materials, 
because it makes them much more flexible, even more flexible than they are at the moment. And again, I've seen some amazing videos about mini robot teams producing and creating you know, various structures. Do watch if you've got a chance to. Um, um, automated cranes, um, a, certain types of crane have actually automated crane have been around for a long time, particularly in, um, as you can see, in shipbuilding, but also, for example, you think of an Amazon facility, essentially there, there's a type of crane that picks things up, moves things around, gets it to a distribution point, goes on to some vehicle or other, and off it goes. Um, but a lot of the things that move around the facility are actually automated cranes. They don't need human intervention at all or human um, supervision. Um, but these types of cranes are more difficult for various reasons. But as you can see, um, this is actually an experimental crane. It's actually in the process of being trialled now um, in, again, in Israel. Never serves me right. Um, and they're fully programmable, so again, don't need human intervention, don't need human um, supervision. And very similar to the sorts of things that Jacques Fresco was saying with the Venus Project many years ago, using things like GPS for tracking and guidance with a lot of these um, auto, you know, um, autonomous robot type technologies you will actually find that you know they can be much more accurate, much more precise with the work that they're doing, and also with location. Um, whereas at the moment, yeah, they have to be guided more, or put in place where they need to be, as with that crane there. Um, one of my favourites, nothing to do with head, of course. Um, but essentially, this material has as you can see, I mean, this is a, a version of um, a, a house or building created with hemp creep. Um, hemp shivs are the thick stalks at the base of, 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 of hemp plants. Um, they're ground down, mixed with water and lime. Um, and the main quality is breathable, regulates moisture and humidity, it's lightweight very high quality insulation, as it says, both acoustic and thermal. Um, interesting enough, actually absorbs CO2 um, during its lifetime. Um, which, you know, given the current situation, might be quite helpful. Um, source material can be grown and renewed quickly. And as some people may be already aware, growing hemp is actually more sustainable than growing wood. One, because of the length of time. Two, because of the amount of resources that trees need from their local soil. Hemp actually needs considerably less of those resources. I mean, it doesn't drain the soil in the same way as trees. Not drain, but it doesn't use as much of the soil's resource as trees do. Um, so that's one thing. The next one you might think find quite surprising because it's actually quite old, but it's coming back into fashion. Um, cob, as it's called. Um, it's a mixture, as it says, of like a subsoil, um, depending on where you live, what type of subsoil that might be, water, organic material, um, fibrous, for example, hay or something similar. Um, you could even use wheat fibres, husks, things like that. Um, sand and clay aggregate, if, you, if, it's neat, if it needs more binding, and it can be mixed with lime and applied with the lime plus as that building has been. Um, it's a very old building technique, but as you can see, I think it's being brought into the 21st century and updated and scaled up to produce buildings like this. Um, zero carbon emissions, very low energy, and tends to use local resources again, so you can build on site in the location where you want to build. Um, and as it says, can be combined with renewable energy generation and storage technologies and be self-sufficient. So you can either be plugged into a grid or you can actually generate your own supply um, on site for that building. Which again, as I said before, diffuse energy generation, that would be my preference of direction. Um, okay, recycled plastics. Um, I've seen various combinations of this, but 
This I found really interesting, the fact that there is now a technology that's being used to actually grind down various forms of plastic um, into pellets or even smaller um, forms like micro size. Um, we all know about micro beads, but it's not quite that. Um, and essentially they are, they're, for want of a better word, they're melted, but they're molded into bricks or similar shapes. And they, generally speaking, they're actually done, that's all done locally on site where the plastic's produced. So what you can do is if you know what type of building you want, you can actually create bricks accordingly. So they could be different sizes, different shapes. Um, so again, that's quite helpful because it, if you're going to use resources, use them wisely. Um, and as you can see, so um, essentially these materials get um, are used in all sorts of construction, moment, bricks, roofing, something called plasphalt, which I've only come across in the last couple of years, which is quite interesting. Um, and despite the fact that people think that roads might not be a really um, ideal place to use plastic technology, it's actually really, they, they last. They last even better than asphalt does, particularly in hot temperatures, which surprised me. So, um, they're seismic resistant, fire resistant, obviously depending on the type of plastic. Um, but again, very good thermal and acoustic insulation. Um, very low CO2 emissions. Um, um, in the end material production, some of the temperatures needed to melt down the plastic are quite high, but again, you can use renewable energy sources to create the energy you need to melt the plastic. Um, so you can create a closed loop system again. Um, can be combined again with renewable energy generation and storage technologies and be self-sufficient. So either gridded, off-grid, or a combination thereof. Um, so there we have it. Um, my, I think my, again, I just want to stress that this covered four areas of technology. Um, there are so many forms of technology that we can actually use very beneficially to actually produce the results that we want to, which is far less resource use, reducing emissions and the effect that that has on, on climate change and global warming, and therefore on the devastation of the environment that we know is already happening and we've seen very clearly from the uh, presentation from Extinction Rebellion. So what I would say to you is, yes, this system doesn't actually encourage positive thinking around technology, but please just remember it is possible and it can benefit all of us. Thank you.